Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear vascular surgeons and hematology colleagues all over the universe. Welcome to our ninth webinar meeting titled Lessons We Learn from Vascular Practice. Let me introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Omar Farooq. Hello, Omar. Uh, let me introduce our great uh, speakers today. Professor Eduardo Ramachotti from Brazil, Dr. Homan Jale from Netherlands, Dr. Mark Whitley from United Kingdom. And, uh, we have to welcome our great panelists, Professor Nick Morrison from United States, Dr. Bola Ortiz from Uruguay, Dr. Attilio Cafizzi from Italy, Dr. Erwin Tonder from Holland, Dr. Askat Sharibov from Kazakhstan, Dr. Loel Kamnik from United States, and uh, Dr. Angelo Scoderi from Brazil. Welcome all of you, and it's nice to have uh, you uh, with us today. Uh, now I have to introduce our great speaker, uh, as the, they call him, the thrombosis man. Let me welcome Dr. Eduardo Ramachotti from Brazil. Dr. Eduardo is a professor of vascular surgery at Santa Casa School of Medicine, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and visiting professor of vascular surgery at Loyola, uh, Loyola. University Medical Center at Chicago, United States. Dr. Eduardo has extensive experience uh, in hemostasis and thrombosis with more than 95 papers and four chapter books. Uh, Dr. Eduardo uh, awarded uh, by the year 2009, the National US Award for Innovative Vascular Research uh, in uh, vena thromboembolism and the global award of uh, developing new marker for vena thromboembolism. I myself took uh, Dr. Eduardo as a reference when uh, studying the soluble B selectin in the diagnosis of the vena thrombosis. Uh, Dr. Eduardo, as uh, he promised in his Twitter, he promised by developing a new well-organized paper regarding COVID-19 and thrombosis. Now, please, Dr. Eduardo, the mic is yours and you are happy to learn from you a lot. Okay, Dr. thank Eduardo? you very much, guys. Uh, and I hope you're hearing me. Can you hear me, Dr. Ayman? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen and I have to apologize, but as you are all aware, we are in the middle of the peak here in Brazil. As of now, I have 320 COVID patients in our hospital. 125 on ICU. So we're in the middle of a war with a lot of arterial and venous thrombosis. I'll show you some of the literature and some of the personal experience, what we're seeing here in Brazil. And if somebody have any, any other idea to our strategies, given the fact that you are thinking out of the box, you might help us handling the enormous amount of arterial and venous thrombosis we're seeing here. So I'll start sharing my screen. Just give me one second. Can you guys see my presentation? Dr. Ayman, can yes, you see my yes, presentation? We can see. Yes, yes. We can see it very clear. Okay. Nice. So we're going to talk a lot of, oh, these are, I have a lot of conflict of interest. I work with all anticoagulants and I have personally worked in development of a Pixabon. So imagine all the conflict of interest, I have them all. So we now know COVID is totally a pandemic and the big problem is hypoxemia and severe acute respiratory syndrome. 
We know that card cardiovascular disease previous increases the risk of severe forms, but what we're learning is that surviving patients from the severe forms of COVID without previous history of cardiovascular disease are developing cardiovascular disease, particularly cardiomyopathy and a lot of thromboembolic disease. We know that the major problem, major, is the direct microvascular thrombosis. We have no doubt that that's the big problem, and I'll show you the mechanism. And we're dealing with anticoagulants in two situations, treating our patients that do have COVID and treating patients that are in the middle of the pandemic have indication for, for anticoagulation strategy. So that's the kind of arterial thrombosis we're seeing a lot here. It resembles a acute thrombongeitis, and you do a CT scan in these patients and you see the the, the typical pattern of COVID. And this was already reported by Chinese colleagues with a fair number of amputations. And this is the kind of VTE we're seeing here. This lady arrived last week. Uh, she went to, to, to ventilators in, in a very fast uh, fashion. She developed a massive phlegmasia cerulea dolens, unresponsible to anticoagulation and unresponsible to our TPA. We didn't have time. She died in six hours with incredibly very high uh, D-dimers. We don't know yet why some of our patients are developing so massive arterial and venous thrombosis. We, we need to identify that. Fortunately, it is not on all patients, but we're seeing here a fair number of them developing thrombosis that are resistant to full anticoagulation strategies. This is the mechanism. This is a paper of our group. It was just accepted. I'm a vascular surgeon, so we created a very simple cartoon to explain to vascular colleagues how it works. So you have a virus that attacks directly the lungs. It attacks directly the alveolar tissue with a lot of fibrin, and it causes a direct pulmonary immunothrombosis in the microarterial system. That's why we see very early in the disease a increase in D-dimer levels. So D-dimer levels, they increase. We have platelet activation, tissue damage, and in combination with a systemic COVID infection, we have in some patients the cytokine storm and the interplay between inflammation and hypercoagulation with a lot of thrombin generation and with a total shutdown of the fibrinolytic system. And I think this is key. And on top of that, we have sick people with immobilization, prior cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, pulmonary diseases, and probably something genetic that we don't know yet that leads to some of the patients, those catastrophic things. So we're seeing a lot of primary pulmonary thrombosis, a lot of pulmonary embolism, not much DVTs, but a lot of pulmonary embolism, a fair number of arterial thrombosis, some myocardial infarctions, a fair number of ischemic strokes, and a very high uh, rate of cardiovascular death. So that's the very simple mechanism we imagine for the catastrophic events we're seeing some patients or not even the catastrophic but this mechanism explains both the DVTs and pulmonary embolism we're also seeing a lot and uh, in factologists they're showing us that the major problem is a direct lesion of the virus towards the alveolar tissue and towards the endothelial I have some beautiful pictures in a paper published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, where some pathologists demonstrated in a clear fashion that we have a direct heat of the endothelial. And that's the typical pattern on the CT scans. I think you all are seeing that. And the angiograms are showing in some patients massive, massive pulmonary embolism. So this paper was published last week. I think it was a superb work from this pathologist from Germany. And they showed in a clear fashion major microvessel thrombosis with a lot of virus infecting the endothelial. And they compared to lungs from age one and one patients. And it's quite clear that we have severe endothelial injury 
with a lot, nine times more microthrombosis and microangiopathy in the, in the COVID patients as compared to H1N1. And they did a multiplex analysis of gene activation. And they had observed alteration in 29 genes that leads to new angiogenesis. And they saw this new angiogenesis in 2.7 times more as compared to age one and one lungs. So we're dealing with a very aggressive virus in some patients to the endothelial system. That's why we're probably seeing a lot of this in some patients, fortunately catastrophic events. So from the laboratory abnormalities, we're seeing a lot of lymphopenia, Lactate and all the inflammatory markers are increased, particularly D-dimers. We're seeing a fair number of patients, even not severe patients, with high D-dimer levels. And the higher the D-dimer, the more severe and poor prognosis. And we're seeing a lot of increase in interleukin-6, which also correlates with poor prognosis. And in some patients, the cytokine storm with excess of thrombin generation and the fibrinolysis shut down. Uh, blood work like PT, INR, TT, APTT are kind of useful and we're learning how to, to, to deal with these patients with the thrombelastometry. Our folks here are trying to figure out if we, we find a way to use it to guide us to, in terms of, of anticoagulation for these patients. Our group has published last year, given the fact that I, I, I now live here in Brazil, we have a lot of Zika and Chikungunya patients and we have already saw some very strange DVT-related cases of chikungunya. We saw this increase of D-dimers in both Zika and chikungunya, and particularly higher on chikungunya patients, and it correlates with cardiovascular events as well. So probably this virus also have a endothelial damage, but not as much as uh, SARS-CoV number two. Well, uh, some folks in the Netherlands, it's a clock paper, very famous now. They published initially that one third of the patients that are in their hospital develop any kind of venous thromboembolism or arterial thrombotic disorders, but they reevaluated their own publication. And then they republished that and they showed that half of the patients on ICU develop any kind of thrombosis. The great, the majority of them, 87% of them, out of this 50% with a pulmonary embolism or pulmonary, primary pulmonary thrombosis, and then strokes, and then arterial thrombosis, and they saw very few DVTs with a lot of cardiovascular death as well. And we're kind of replicating these numbers here in my country. We have a lot of patients here, and it is exactly uh, these numbers that our folks in the Netherlands saw. So what do we do? For the regular patient that is in hospital, it is reasonable to think about VTE prophylaxis and we're following, as of now, uh, the recommendation of the World Health Organization and International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. We do the regular prophylaxis. Some folks are doing full heparinization. Some folks are doubling the dose of low molecular weight heparins. Well, I'm very conservative towards that. I think and I believe we should wait for the trials that I'll show you guys that are ongoing. So as for now, we are using the regular doses for VTE prophylaxis with the parenteral drugs. We have enoxaparin here, so we're using 40 milligrams. We're also using fondapadinux because guess what? We're seeing a shortage in heparin in the country and it's produced in China. It is a biological compound. It was expected to see some shortage so we're using a lot of fondapadinux as well. And in some hospitals, we don't even have an oxaparin. We're using unfractionated heparin. The regular dose is already studied for VDE prophylaxis in the medically ill population. And we are also using in the hospitals that we have available mechanical prophylaxis. And it is nice if you have elastic stockings and uh, compression devices, uh, it is very useful to, to, to prevent DVTs in these patients. We don't have trials, but we, we basically don't need them. We are trying to avoid as much as possible endovascular procedures in these patients, unless you have really, really high risk of pulmonary embolism and strong uh, uh, contraindication for anticoagulation following the guidelines. And we base our, our assumptions in the VTE prophylaxis in the medical ill in the old trials with the Medinox prevent and Artemis that showed 50% relative risk reduction of events in in-hospital patients. And we know that 
or drugs kind of failed, particularly for the in-hospital phase of the treatment. We have some positive trials with the APEX and the, and the MARINER trial, but as for now, we're recommending in-hospital the classic doses for VTE prophylaxis with unfractionated heparin and oxaparin or fondaparinose. We're thinking about extensions based basically on, on a old trial from Russell Ho with enoxaparin, and we're also thinking about extensions because of the super high D-dimer with rivaroxaban or betrixaban that we don't have here in my country, as, as I am informed, only in the U.S. But bear in mind that there is increase in the risk of major bleeds when you extend uh, VTE prophylaxis for, for the out-of-hospital. What we're seeing here, and I'm personally seeing, I receive from calls every 15 minutes from colleagues, discharging patients from the hospital, they did not end up on the ventilator, but the dimers around 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and my colleagues are kind of very concerned with this D dimer levels. We, we never treated D dimer levels, D dimer just guides, but it is reasonable to extend. So if you extend the VTE prophylaxis, and this is a paper of ours, we're using these cartoons to help uh, medical education, use parenterals in the hospital. And if you have high improved score or high D-dimers, it is reasonable to extend for more 45 days and you can use rivaroxaban or enoxaparin or betrixaban. Well, we, we published the Mariner trial two years ago. We tested this extension and we were a kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say aggressive in the endpoints, but we wanted to show a reduction in mortality by pulmonary embolism and we failed with that. But guess what? When we look at uh, symptomatic VTEs, we had a reduction of around 50% without increasing major bleeds. So I'm a big fan of the Mariner trial. We'll have the approval from, from, for the label here in Brazil. It is on the label in the US. So for these discharged patients, we're, we're giving, for those who have the conditions, 10, 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban for 45 days. And the FDA approved this indication in the US probably a year ago, based on the, a, a combined data analysis of Magellan and Mariner trial. Well, what did the Chinese showed us? This is a, a paper, this paper is being cited a lot from Tang. They took a lot of really sick people and they gave heparin to 100 of them and 300 they didn't give heparin. And guess what? They showed no benefit in mortality with full heparinization for the patients. And this being replicated in, in, in different countries. But they observed that Patients with a super high D-dimer, around six-fold the upper normal limit, or the sepsis-induced coagulopathy score greater than four, then they, they showed some benefit in terms of giving heparin to these patients. Now, Professor Narula from New York, from Mount Sinai, they performed a observational study, and they saw basically the same thing. There is no advantage in giving full anticoagulation dose for in-hospital patients, but for those with uh, ventilators, really sick people on the ICU, they showed a significant reduction of 14% in mortality, but it's a pure observational study. It is not a randomized trial, but I, I am informed a lot of colleagues in the US are giving full heparinization for patients in the ICU. So now how do we treat it? Basically, we don't invent the wheel. We are treating DVTs in these patients the, the way we are very used to. Uh, we tried some RTPA more aggressive. It didn't work. So we're, we're keeping very conservative until we get more data and until we get the randomized control trials. But we are not inventing doses for anticoagulants as of for now. And I'll justify why we're not creating. So use the regular doses of both infractionated heparin and oxaparin and fondaparin nooks to treat both DVT and pulmonary embolism. And this is a cartoon we're using here to educate the, the doses for DOAX. And of course, we're using DOAX, not in hospital, but when we discharge these patients, it is nice to keep hospital beds for really sick people. So we are discharging our patients with the DOAX with the proper doses. And remember, if you're using dabigatron or Edoxaban, we need injections in the beginning of the treatment. 
So these are the kind of patients we're seeing here. We're kind of desperate with them. We're, we're testing the hypothesis that we should combine antivirals. We don't have, unfortunately, severe here. Full dose heparin or TPA, we're also thinking about a prostadil for the primary pulmonary thrombosis. And probably we will combine uh, interleukin inhibitors for the severe cases. And we have a couple of months seeing this horrible cases to our projections here in Sao Paulo. This is terrifying. Uh, some colleagues from China observed kids developing a kind of Kawasaki disease. And to, to remember our folks, Kawasaki is a rare acute pediatric vasculitis. Uh, and the worst problem is on the coronary arteries of these kids with aneurysms. But we see different things. We see even abdominal aortic aneurysms in kids with Kawasaki. And then a colleague from Italy reported 10 cases with kids with around seven and a half year with Kawasaki-like disease in Bergamo at the peak of the pandemic in the country. And then our folks in the UK showed exactly the same thing. But the, 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 the British folks are suggesting to change the name and do not use Kawasaki-like, but use something like inflammatory multisystem syndrome temporarily associated with the SARS-CoV-2, they're calling it PINS ts Fortunately, they saw very few cases in the UK, few cases in Italy, but in New York, 136 cases with a lot of amputations in kids. I did not see this paper yet, I just received uh, information by, by telephone, but they will publish this series and this is terrifying. So as for now, for these kids, they're using anticoagulants, IL-6 inhibitors, and they're kind of very concerned in identify why these kids develop this inflammatory disease. Because once we have vaccines for COVID, we will need clarification to see we're not, if we do not induce uh, pediatric vasculitis in our kids. We saw two kids here in, in Brazil with this pims ts syndrome not as much as in New York, but we are in the beginning of the peak. We'll probably see that. And this information was published at The Lancet uh, 15 days ago. Fortunately, bleeding is not common. It is uncommon. We're seeing some of the bleeds because of the very liberal use of heparin. And we're, we're following the, 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 the ICU protocols to control bleeds. We're avoiding to use fresh flows and plasma. We're using PCC and we're keeping and following the World Health Organization that recombinant thrombomodulin and tranexamic acid uh, are not indicated for these patients. How, what do we do with DVT patients, regular DVTs that do not have COVID, but they need to go to the hospital? We're, do, we're using telemedicine. Uh, the US CDC indicated that there is an increased risk of severe COVID in patients with receiving blood thinners, but it's, it's just not true. We don't have data that anticoagulants increases the risk of severe COVID forms. And as a matter of fact, it looks like, it just looks like uh, anticoagulants protects these patients. So please keep the doses for your VTE patients and for your arterial patients the way you are used to. For vitamin K antagonists, and this is big in Europe and here in Brazil, we are extending INR testing. Uh, some patients, they do have the INR control in their homes with the point of care devices. In Europe, some folks developed drive through for INR checks. But what we're doing here, and fortunately, some pharma companies are helping us and donating DOAX. We are switching from vitamin K to DOAX. It's easier to, we don't need monitoring, and we're keeping our, our hospital beds clear for the COVID patients. So, what the future expects? We desperately need higher quality data. I, I personally think that personal opinion counts almost to zero. We do have a lot of experience with COVID, but we need to randomize control trials. So ideally, we need data coming from prospective multicenter, multinational studies to prevent these DVTs. Uh, Professor Monreal is helping us with the REAT registry a lot. And we're doing some trials that I'll show you guys here in Brazil in collaboration with US folks and with European folks. And I strongly advise you guys uh, to not abuse of TV publicity talking about thrombosis because it causes a freak out in our patients. 
And if somebody talks about heparin on TV, then people run to the pharmacy to buy heparin. So we're, it's incredible, but we're facing lack of heparin in my country. We have now on clinicaltrials.gov 48 ongoing studies on the anticoagulation realm and COVID. Some are in Europe, some are in the US. And here in Brazil, in collaboration with some US folks, we're doing the, the action trial. We got some support from Bayer. We're going to compare full anticoagulation for all severe patients versus a standard of care. And we will start enrollment probably next Tuesday. We plan to enroll 600 patients. I think it is a very nice number of patients. And we're going we're gonna to use Vibroxaban 20 for 45 days. It's a total different anticoagulation strategy to see if it decrease mortality. So our primary endpoint is mortality and then length of hospital stay and need for oxygen support at day 30. This trial number one, we're starting next week. I'm also replicating the Mariner trial, but dedicated to the Mariner, uh, to, the, the, to the COVID patients. So we're gonna use the, the same, same Mariner inclusion criteria, improve above four or improve two and three with a higher D-dimer. And I plan not to enroll patients that uh, needed ventilators. And at discharge, they have high D-dimers. For a group, we're gonna give Hiroxaban. Then the other group, we're doing no intervention. I declined to give placebo in the middle of a pandemic era. And we're going to do CT scans plus duplex scan from upper and lower limb on day 45. So it's going to give me enough power to see superiority with 320 patients. We're starting this trial probably in 20 days. And these are the inclusion criteria. We're going to follow up the, the Mariner trial. So I finished my presentation with a very important paper from folks from Philadelphia that saw in previous pandemics, heroic measurements versus randomized control trials. And guess what? They conclude that human research, not in conformity with scientific standards, are totally ethically questionable, particularly in the pandemic area. We have those crazy drugs, and I don't know in our country, but here it is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine became something very political without proper data. So we generated a plethora of new treatments. And in desperate situations, we have multiple drugs and our colleagues that are on the front line do not have reliable information about their effects. And these guys collect information from the AIDS area to the Ebola pandemic to the SARS-CoV-1 in 2012. So uh, I'm a strong advocate for clinical trials, particularly on the air of the pandemic situation. And I like to quote Mr. Edwards Deming saying that without data, you are just another person with an opinion. I finished my presentation here. I have this uh, free educational tool on Instagram. We're doing a weekly broadcast updating vascular colleagues in the COVID and I'm very happy to take questions. And I, I have a lot of questions myself. So I stop sharing here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Eduardo. It was a very nice presentation and uh, a very good uh, and astonishing data. I think first of all, uh, we have to discuss with the panel. Uh, as we all know, the mechanism of venous thrombosis differs a little bit for uh, uh, developing arterial thrombosis. But you see both in COVID, that's great. Uh, I may ask uh, Dr. Nick, what's your opinion uh, about uh, developing both arterial and venous thrombosis in COVID? Do you have a comment for that? Yeah, thank you very much. Thankfully, I have no experience treating COVID patients. Uh, I am strictly in the office and don't have any experience. Um, as you know, uh, in the US, we've had an absolutely miserable response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, I'm still, uh, while I'm following closely uh, the, the effects of thrombosis, I am not involved. So I have no opinion. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let us shift to Dr. Uh, Martin. Dr. Martin, uh, what do you think about uh, both arterial and venous thrombosis in COVID? 
دكتور مارتن ميرش ويلكم ابرود I think maybe he is away from the mic. We can we can okay. take the panelist opinion about such a great lecture. Okay, let's go to Bola. Yeah. Bola Ortiz. Okay, from Uruguay. What do you think, Bola? Um, okay, I think about um, so. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, excellent presentation, Ramashioti. Thank you very much for all the information. Um, so I was reading about this uh, publication um, from New England Journal of Medicine last week, and they showed the widespread uh, microthrombosis in arteries and veins in the lungs. So it happened in all uh, all all the the arteries and veins. So I think uh, we, we don't know much about, and in Uruguay, we don't have much experience neither because uh, hopefully it's good, the, the, the incident is low. <clears throat> but uh, see, from all this data we have from the smallest studies, all shows like there is a coagulopathy and vascular, so new vessels also and vasculitis. So this all um, speak about, uh, you know, uh, like deep uh, thrombosis and also from uh, a widespread thrombosis explaining all these uh, bad outcomes. So, but I don't have experience, of course. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Scuderi from Brazil, Dr. Angelo. Well, good, good night, good evening. <laughs> good evening, good afternoon for all. First of all, I'd like to, to, to congrats Dr. Ramachote, is my old friend. And uh, I, I, I very, I like very much your presentation. Very interesting. As I, I have no experience with COVID. I am in quarantine. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, but I like very much. But, I have some 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 doubts about this uh, this disease. Indeed, it's very complex, and uh, I think we don't know the mechanism of this virus uh, act in our organism. It's very complex, and uh, um, I think uh, this this the the is very important to use this anticoagulation. I believe this is the, the, the uh, uh, but I am listening here. My sons work in the hospital and they say me that they are using routinely the, uh, the uh, not sparing uh, by the, the, the treatment of these patients. I, I hope we have more success in the treatment of this disease. I, I, I honestly, I don't know what is the future of this disease. What what we must expect of this. But I'm very happy to take part of this group. It was very interesting, and uh, congratulate Osiris, uh, Eduardo, son of Osiris. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are you are. We, I am proud to have one colleague like you in Brazil. Thank you. Okay, we can take the question by Martin. Martin Marish, do you like to ask your question after such a great lecture by Professor Eduardo? Your mic is on, Martin. I think there is a problem with his mic, uh, I'm, so you can, uh, if we can take the opinion of Loyal Kabnik about such a great lecture. And what a great lecture, thank you. I took many pictures, that's why I was in and out of video. I can a presentation, Dr. Kabnik. It's my pleasure. Yes. We have a, a combined presentation for vascular surgeons. I have mine and Dr. Comerota and we are spreading it for educational purposes. So shoot me your email and I'll send it back to you. Well, I need to get your email, so we'll figure it out and we'll get together. Um, in, in the United States, I don't have first-hand uh, experience, but what I understand from my vascular colleagues, if you're taking a patient to the 
operating room, it's pretty bleak in terms of success. Is that your experience, early experience? It is very strange. It is a different thrombosis. For acute arterial, uh, when you have a acute uh, uh, arterial occlusion, you pass the Fogart and it's gluing. It, it is strange. It's a different mechanism. But it is in some patients, not in all patients. And what I'm seeing here, and, and, and probably this fits for a fair number of you guys, as you are aware, we have a large number of phlebologists in my country, people dedicated to the aesthetical treatment. And his colleagues are calling me and say, what do I do? My office is closed now because people are so afraid of, of going to regular aesthetic treatments. And I've been telling, go to the ICU. We have campaign hospitals. And a fair number of colleagues, and Paola knows one of them, some of them, they're on, on, uh, on night shifts on ICU, inserting central venous lines and helping us. Because here in Sao Paulo, I told you, in the hostel I work, we're ha we have today 340 patients with COVID. And a fair number of them are on the ICU. And we're, we have in Sao Paulo probably seven campaign hospitals packed with patients. And Dr. Kabnick, it's different. And some of the patients, you give heparin, they just don't respond. You put a Fogarty catheter, it doesn't come. It is very, we will learn in the upcoming months. But for a particular group of patients that we did not know, understood yet how to identify them, we're seeing catastrophic events. I, I, I'm convinced we will find something genetic or something probably in the interplay between interleukins and anticoagulation. Sure. But it is a, a personal impression that is something regarding the mechanism that the virus damages the endothelial system. So from a probably clinical point, factors, yeah. from, from a clinical point of view, when are you reluctant to take patients to surgery now? Or are you still going to, even though that, that your results may not be because we can't well, predict. Well, Dr. Kapnik, we cannot predict in a acute arterial case needs to go to OR, you know. We're using the resources we have. And see, there's a, another thing. Patients are afraid to go to the hospital. And they're dying by myocardial inf infarction in their homes. So colleagues from New York reported that in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we're seeing exactly the same thing. People are afraid to go to the hospital because the COVID dying by cardiovascular disease. So now that patients are learning that, I'm seeing in the hospital an increase of regular non-COVID arterial and venous thromboembolism patients back to our, our, our care. And the decision from our health authorities that are in a mess, our government here is screwing everything, uh, is that we should keep uh, the severe cases, elective surgery, particularly for cancer patients and for cardiovascular patients. And it's tough to identify who will and who will not work, Dr. Kabinek. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Martin wants to discuss uh, some point regarding the treatment too. Dr. Martin, are you ready? Uh, I, think, uh, I think there is a problem with the voice of Martin Marish. So yeah. uh, we can check uh, with another panelist. Okay, uh, let's ask uh, Askat. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Martin is ready now to uh, to give your comment. Not yet. Okay, uh, Dr. Askat, uh, are you ready to give your comments now? Yes, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ayman. Nice to see all colleagues in good health. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eduardo, for your excellent presentation. So I have not any experience to treat uh, COVID-19 in Kazakhstan. I, am, I have a phlebology practice, small phlebology practice. So, But my, uh, your presentation is very interesting, very interesting and useful. So my question is, in, uh, uh, my first sentence, um, only four cases, uh, according to your presentation, of deep vein thrombosis and uh, 78 persons of pulmonary embolism. Uh, those COVID-19 causes a massive microthrombosis, which generally result 
and the highest number of pulmonary of pulmonary embolies. So it's not uh, it's uh, non usual uh, and new uh, new uh, disease. Uh, if we if we could uh, compare with uh, usual pneumonia, for example. So. Uh, what is the role of antiviral therapy in in, in this context? Uh, what do you well, think? Because we have uh, a lot of uh, cardiovascular events um, as a complication of COVID-19. Well, uh, I cannot answer you because we don't have data. But we have the impression, if I had Redensivir here, that's the only one that works as for now, in a very mild effect. I would use it compassionately in these patients and I would collect data on that. We think that probably reducing the viral load and controlling the cytokine storm would be a, a way to go. But we don't have here. So I, I cannot answer you because we didn't test it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Uh... Let's ask Dr. Kavidi. I know you are uh, listening carefully as I saw you concentrating very much. And I think you have some questions uh, to Dr. Eduardo. Well, uh, thanks Eduardo for your very nice lecture. Well, what we do, what we did listening to our friends in Brescia, Bergamo and so on, was to suggest as vasculars, I mean, heparin since the very beginning, they were reluctant, but then they accepted it, let's say. So going ahead, we wanted to study some laboratory data. I have no special patients, no, not personally, but studying this data, we published just yesterday a little paper, and in case we can share it with you, because it would be very profitable for, for us at least. And what we, con what we focused was the iron metabolism on one side and the hemoglobin metabolism, because it seems virus has this double action anyway. What we know is that on one side we have hypoxia, we have inflammation, all this stuff. But also we have the problem of a parafibrin formation, parafibrin formation typical of uh, ferroptosis. So, I mean, the metabolism of, of iron seems to be very important in this case because ferritin is 4,000, 5,000, which is not normal in traditional, let's say, inflammation. It would be nice to understand probably this mechanism as to the hypercoagulation and the fiber information everywhere, let's say. I don't know if you had the opportunity to study from this side, the iron and the hemoglobin metabolism. Dr. Cavazzi, what we're doing, since we're gonna have with us 600 prospective patients for the severe form, plus 320 for the mild form. And we will also study patients at home and give anticoagulants for them, and it's gonna be problem 1,800. We decided to collect blood from them all in two different time points. And when we have time, we will do the biomarker analysis. So uh, some basics we're gonna do, but we're gonna preserve that blood for future studies. And this is something if you need, and if you want more information, we can do the analysis for this, I think very valuable amount of blood collected in this pandemic area. So we're planning as for now to study the dimers, all the panel of interleukins. We're gonna use some microparticles, tissue factor, thrombomoduline, PI-1, and some other markers, but we're gonna collect a lot of blood. So if you feel that something burning, we can surely collaborate and do the analysis. And we're gonna do a kind of baseline and 45 days treatment happening. I mean, just for example, then I close my, I shut my mouth. I mean, just for example, from Harvard, there was uh, two months ago, a very nice presentation, very nice paper about the hepcidine mimicking action mm -hmm. of the virus. I mean, hepcidine is extremely important. So it seems, virus is an hepcidine. That's why uh, the body accumulates a huge amount of iron everywhere in the tissues and in the endothelial cells. And that's probably the main problem at the end of the day. It would be nice well, to understand it. Yeah, I'm not an hematologist, but what we're learning the hard way is that ferritin levels correlate with poor prognosis. 
and we can't i could not understand it yet but it seems reasonable that it's connected to what we're talking here okay okay great uh, i think uh, martin is ready now oh. i hope i hope it's working now yes it's okay we hear you I'm 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 really glad uh, I'm a part of this discussion. I want to share two patients. Uh, I think both of them are crucial in a different ways, and I would love to hear your opinion about uh, about both of them uh, because the panel is very strong. So the first patient was the arterial patient coming with a critical limb, and he was the, he was decompensated on the first side, and it was very obvious he was short of breath, and, and he was unable to lie down. And when I informed his brother that the, the patient is very sick, and, and then we did the ejection fraction was 10%. We did echocardiography, and he was completely decompensated. And I explained them, it's not about the procedure, but he's very close to dying. And his brother kept repeating about COVID negative, COVID negative doctor, don't worry about him, he's COVID negative. And this is like, this is very important point because people nowadays, they don't get it. Like, you know, they, they keep, they are focused so much on, on COVID, uh, but the people are dying from different reasons as well. So this is the first, this is the first patient I, I declined and I sent him to cardiologist to, to be treated first. And the second patient was a patient with a DVT, young British patient here in, in, patient here in, in Bahrain and, and he was admitted with a DVT. He was tested negative but we, with uh, almost one third of the negative testing, I, you know, uh, I took him basically as a, as, a, as a very high risk patient anyway. And we did a thrombolysis and it was very, you know, it was very successful and patient was discharged in a good condition. So my question is guys, do you treat COVID patients with uh, DVT as a regular patient with thrombolysis and thrombectomies? And what is your outcome with these patients? Well, I can take it that one, Martin. What we're doing, we're keeping the indications. You know, we are very conservative in terms of doing thrombolysis here, but we do. And we did some last week and we got good results. So uh, we're following the, 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 our protocols exactly as this patient did not have COVID. We're not increasing doses, not even over indicating because we don't have data. But we have good results. In, in some fibrinolysis we did treating these patients. And to be sincere to one of them, we didn't even know if the patient had or didn't have because tests weren't available in one of the public hospitals. So we're, we're keeping the guidelines, my friend, as for now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, all right. Uh, before I leave the mic to Omar, uh, I'd like to welcome Erwin. Uh, he was driving his car, the auto drive Call and he arrived safely. Uh, welcome, Erwin. I think you have a comment for uh, Dr. Uh, Eduardo. No, just a really uh, wonderful presentation during the drive, and, uh, and I was looking carefully at your slides uh, as well as the road. But a uh, brilliant presentation. As like Nick Morrison. Hello, Nick. It was a long time ago that I've seen you when you disappeared. And hello, good evening to all. Um, I think Atilio, I think you, uh, you know, you've had a lot of experience and I was ex very happy that you were able to share your thought, uh, you know, to all the people who are interested. And I think it's very good that, you know, Atilio Cavesi and, 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 and everybody would share their experience because there's very little knowledge that's, you know, evidence-based. It's good to have these trials set up in a very short period of time uh, and record time. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, once again for you, for your invitation to be here tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Erwin. Now the mic is yours, Omar. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ayman. Um, thank you very much, Professor Eduardo. It was a fantastic lecture. Um, you did summarize to us your experience, and uh, we're sorry that you have so much uh, big number, but uh, your research is fascinating, and we are all looking eager for your answer. Uh, I will take, we have uh, five questions uh, to you, Professor Eduardo. I will take them quickly. There is a question from Dr. Ahmed Abu Arabi. He said, thank you very much. Is there is any rule of corticosteroids? 
Well, uh, it, it, it does and it does not have. I'm not a a a uh, infectologist, but there are some trials using corticosteroids, and we have some controversial results. Some people are reporting a decrease in time of ventilators, and people are reporting an increase in time of ventilator. I don't. I personally, what I'm seeing here, uh, and I, as I told you, I saw a large number of patients. It seems to work, but these guys are refining in which patients they are using corticosteroids, and we're finishing a trial here. And I think the solidarity trial will also bring that answer if the regular corticosteroids works or it doesn't. As for now, we have conflicting data. Okay. If I had to choose on me, I would take IL-6 inhibitors. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the lesson also to stick to uh, the golden standard of randomized controlled trial before giving any decision, rather than to go with experience and then found that it contradicts. That's a very solid point that you put forward. Another question from Dr. Omar uh, at Dahlan. Uh, from Saudi Arabia, he said, is there is a rule of antiplatelets regarding decreased thrombotic events in COVID-19? Can you answer that? Yeah, this is a good question. Who, who, asked, who asked that? Yes, a uh, very famous intervention radiologist from Saudi Arabia, Dr. Omar Dahlan. Well, I had a call with Dr. Komerota. I was trained by him. He's a personal friend of mine in the U.S., and he's testing it in his service. He, he is a strong advisor for dipiridamol for these patients. Looking at this, this, this uh, autopsy lungs, he is convinced that we will help patients with antiplatelet agents. Yeah. yeah, but I can't test everything. So we need to share, you know, I basically cannot test antiplatelet as of now because I'm focused in, in different things. But Dr. Comerota is testing in a fair number of patients in the service in Virginia. And he's a big advocator. He feels that it will work. Okay. Another interesting question from Professor Ahmed Gawish from Egypt. He said, very interesting presentation. And he would like to know the relation between mortality and D-dimer level. The D-dimer level is a marker of the endothelial damage in COVID-19. This is the cause of the relation? It is according to a Chinese paper they showed a very high mortality rates in patients with six times the upper limit. So going to ventilators plus having super high D-dimers, the higher the D-dimer, the higher the risk of mortality. And they showed benefit of full heparinization in this particular group. The higher the D-dimer, the greater the benefit of giving heparin. So as for now, uh, uh, we're doing the trials, we're about to start the trials. But what we're doing for really sick people on ventilators, we're giving full heparinization based in, in the observations from our New York colleagues and the Chinese colleagues. Yes, so okay. my answer is yes. High D-dimers yeah. correlates with mortality. Okay, I will take one final question. He's asking about COVID-19 tools, the bluish discoloration in COVID-19. He said, is there is any addition to anticoagulation if you face a patient with covid 19 blue toes? Uh, well, I saw these toes in some of them, but I don't know what to do with that sign, you know. I didn't have time to correlate it with some outcomes or bad strategy to what to do. We're seeing the COVID toes. Toes was observed by, by, by people here and in Europe and in the US, but I don't know what it means as for now. I really don't know. Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic answer. And thank you very much. Delighted to be accepted. Yes, uh, we have a question from Professor Sukhdri. Yes, please go ahead. Open your mic. Yeah, open your mic. If you can unmute, you did mute again. Another press. Uh, That's it. Okay. We can hear you. Go uh, ahead. No, no, I just want to make a comment. The, the effect of the patient go to the intensive care is enough is, uh, is enough to make indication from uh, antithrombotic therapy because the patient become many time in bed many days many days and this is just this is it is a 
could be a cause of the, the thromboembolism. So I think the parinization, the anticoagulation, is imperative in the treatment of these, uh, these patients. Not just for the disease, but the fact of the, be, to be uh, in intensive therapy for a long time. What do you think, uh, Ramachot, about this? Well, we're testing it, Angelo. Uh, I can only answer based on my trials. The answer is not mine. The, the, the answer belongs to the randomization and the proper trial. But Dr. Naru observed that patients on ventilators that received full heparinization had a reduction in mortality around 14%. It is observational with all the bias of lack of randomization, but we're, we're changing our practice because we don't have much time. So for the own ventilators, we're giving full heparinization. As for now, if they do not have a contraindication for that. Okay, thank Good you very test. much. That was a fascinating that's lecture. Right, right. And yes, and the sorry to take you from uh, such a busy hospital with 350 COVID positive. So I know that every minute uh, of your time is extremely valuable. Thank you very much. And the mic is back again to Professor Ayman. And thank if you, you don't mind, I'll leave Dr. Ayman. And I'll thank you for, for the invitation. And I'll share with you guys my presentation so you can use it freely for medical education. Thank you very much, Dr. Eduardo. It was a great pleasure and honor. It was very good and uh, interactive uh, presentation. Thank you, and we appreciate your time and effort. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and always keep with us, please. Uh, now, uh, I think it is the debate time. Uh, Mr. Khaled, are you, are you ready for the bowling? Uh, to start the debate, there is a question. We'll put it for all attendees. In a patient with iliac compression, stenosis or occlusion, and varicose veins, I go for iliac decompression first. Number one, yes. Number two, no. Please, for all attendees, vote. Uh, I think it will be a very good uh, debate because both uh, opinions uh, will be right. And uh, I think uh, both uh, uh, debaters, uh, Dr. Jolie and uh, Dr. Mark, will put their presentation stated on evidence-based medicine. No winner, it's opinions. and. Uh, depending on the uh, evidence-based medicine. We'll see uh, how uh, we get the answers. Oh, <laughs> Mark, they give you a hard time. <laughs> okay, 87% uh, will go for decompression first. Uh, let us see what will happen after the presentation. Let me introduce uh, the first speaker. Dr. Homan Jale uh, is with the motion and is a director of uh, EVC uh, European Venus Center and he is uh, a senior uh, vascular, vascular research consultant, University of Aachen and Maastricht, and is uh, leading the program of vascular surgery and uh, intervention since uh, 2020. Uh, Dr. Jale has more than 60 articles published. Uh, reviewers uh, with more than 300 uh, uh, citation. Uh, he is going to discuss uh, the decompression of the iliac vein before doing varicose vein ablation. The mic is yours, uh, Homan. Thank you very much, Ayman. It's my pleasure to be here. It's my honor. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, I have to thank Dr. Eduardo for this really brilliant speech. So after this speech, I am ashamed to go with this unimportant topic. It was really brilliant. I learned a lot from him, thanks to him. So I'm going to share my... Uh, can you see my presentation?
Do you see my presentation? Yes? Yes, yes, so, it's okay. Um, yeah, I am for the motion or you give, gave me the, uh, the title and to be for the motion, it will be a hard debate because my opponent is, is Mark and um, he is really my idol. And, but in this topic, I am not with, in his opinion, I'm uh, with another opinion. And this is in um, stenosis or occlusion of the iliofemoral tract and concomitant varicose vein, of course, I'm going first to treat the occlusion. So, and I want to show you why. This is my disclosure. First of all, it's not matter what we are going to treat, we need a profound uh, examination of the patient, clinic, clinical examination. As you can see, very important are very pathognomonic signs of chronic venous obstruction and we have to give a real um, uh, importance to these pathognomic signs, which are the abdominal collaterals, as you can see here. Of course, symptoms of the PTS are very important, venous claudication, especially for uh, occlusion or compression, edema, tension, and hyperpigmentation or skin changes. So I'm showing you the most important tool, diagnostic tool, which is duplex. Thanks to Irvin Thunder, who is here. We have a brilliant uh, duplex technician who gives us really the best venous maps. At the left side, you can see post-thrombotic changes in the groin of a young lady. And here in the middle, you see a involved iliac tract with reflux or backflow into the iliac uh, tract or internal iliac vein. And it, at this point you see in this picture, you see a severe compression as known as my turner. It's not only a compression, it's also a fibrosis of the compressed vein. And again, it's very important if we have young ladies in supine position to give attention, not to over diagnose a my turner, which was already, already addressed by Irvin Tonda in his presentation a few weeks ago. So nearly in all young ladies, you can create somehow a compression, but not only the compression is important, also the fibrosis of the vein. We combine every time our duplex ultrasound findings with uh, imaging. We normally use MR phlebogram, as you can see, for example, in these patients, you see also the superficial veins. You see the common femoral vein at the left side, which is involved in this area. And also you can see the inflow of the leg, which is very important for your decision making. This is the deep femoral vein. And here again, you see a very severe compression between the artery and the bone, or in this area. Here in this patient, you see exactly the collaterals, which is pathognomonic for compression or stenosis, <clears throat> giving you an impression of our venous map. Here are four examples. You see a patient with chronic venous obstruction of IVC and both common iliac veins, and also, of course, the deep and superficial vein are approached by Irving or by me, but my duplex uh, maps are never as beautiful as his venous maps. In this patient, you see involvement of both inflow veins, uh, the deep femoral and femoral vein, and the collaterals do a chronic venous obstruction. And this patient, again, is very interesting now for this topic because this, this uh, patient is suffering from an occlusion below the ligament, and you see the smaller saphenous vein has a reflux, and also other examples. And also we measure the flow at the level of the ostium of deep femoral vein, or a little bit above it. In this patient, we measured in supine position with our machine, uh, 250 milliliter, milliliter per minute. So now for us interesting, I picked up these patients. You see again, 
the chronic minus obstruction and reflux in greater saphenous vein. You see a compression and occlusion with reflux in smaller saphenous vein. And in this patient, you see everything. You see an involvement of the common, a common iliac vein at the right side. It's a chronic venous obstruction or stenosis. At the left side, you see a mild compression. I, I'm not going to call it my turner. And you see both sides varicosities. So I come later and show you how we treated this patient, for example. Going to the pathophysiology, I found this work with this illustration in the paper of Stranden from Oslo, published 2011 in Flebo Lymphology. It's very interesting. <clears throat> you see how the impact of the venous hypertension in deep venous obstruction is. Deep venous obstruction creates the most severe hypertension, and which is the basic, which is the first step of uh, developing PTS. You see the patient after being mobile, you see in the healthy subject and superficial insufficiency reflux elevates the pressure at this amount, but you see the deep venous obstruction makes the highest venous hypertension. Next, next slide. I picked up a, a paper of Raju published in JVS 2019, and again, the paper of Stranden from 2011, and mixed them. And I came to the conclusion, both obstruction and reflux, it is written by them, lead to a venous hypertension in upright position. And of course, as we could see, more in obstruction than the hypertension which was created or which is created by just superficial insufficiency. But in supine position, only obstruction leads to a venous hypertension. That means a patient with iliofemoral obstruction has high venous hypertension in upright position and in resting position every time. And of course, it is logical that this patient creates more PTS or problems than only uh, superficial insufficiency. This is a work of our team in Maastricht. They measured the pressure. At this diagram, you see the healthy leg. At this diagram, in up upright position, you see the involved leg with chronic venous obstruction of femoral or of iliofemoral tract. You see the steady state pressure was already high, and then after exercise, it went nearly up to 100. It is very high, which can never be achieved by a superficial reflux. Now I have to back my opinion somehow uh, with sources in literature. I found this work of Neglin, uh, published 2007. They performed stenting for chronic venous obstruction with brilliant experience, as you can read here. But very important, the beneficial clinical outcome occurred regardless of presence of remaining reflux. That's very important. So the treatment of obstruction is much more important if patients have both. Next paper, which I found is a, from a Chinese group published in Journal of Vascular Interventional Radiology, 2012. They concluded venous stent placement is effective but non-thrombotic iliac vein compression lesions are the most important or an important reason for symptom recurrence after left lower extremity varicose vein surgery. That means this patient had both compression, hemodynamically significant comp compression and varicosities. The varicosities was treated, but the recurrence rate was very high due to, due to this compression. So, and the last literature source is a group of Lowell Kapnick. Lowell is here. This is not the conclusion of the paper. I think Lowell knows the conclusion. So it is a part of the paper in patients with deep venous stenosis. A, a significant healing benefit was seen with stenting. Then with compression therapy or superficial truncal ablation. So these three sources of literature, they back my opinion. Compression should be treated first, then we can think about treatment of 
superficial reflux. Now coming to my first case. So this case again shows you the common iliac vein involvement at the right side and a mild compression. Just show you what we did. So I cannot go on. Now I can go on chronic venous obstruction of the right iliac vein. As you can see, mild compression at my turn up point. This is a venous map uh, performed by Irvin. So complaints of the patient, right leg swelling. It was nearly an entire leg, tension, heaviness, moderate abdominal collaterals, venous claudication, which is also pat patognomonic for chronic venous obstruction and not for superficial venous reflux and cosmetic aspect. Left leg, only distal edema at night, tiredness and cosmetic aspect. And our approach was stenting of the right common iliac vein after six months of follow-up because then the endotelialization is finished. They can stop the anticoagulation and we know everything is okay. Treatment of varicose vein right leg as a stage fashion and then treatment of varicose vein left leg without treating the mild compression on my turnout point. For us, that was not a real my turnout. So now going to the case two, it's a 68 year old uh, male patient who had a PAD and because of this PAD in another tertiary hospital, hospital, they performed the below the knee bypass, as you can see in this picture. And the great saphenous vein of the contralateral side was removed, reversed, implanted. The bypass was every time patent, but the patient developed a really severe non-healing wound or wound disorder, as you can see here. That was the picture in our outpatient clinic before the procedure, and that was his severe lampharia and hyperpigmentation, swelling, tension, pain, as a P PTS. So this is his MRV. I am sorry, I have no venous map because I didn't find the file. So we have also in this case a profound venous map, but here you can see the occlusion of the common femoral vein. And here, very important, you see the great saphenous vein, which is refluxive and goes or goes into the common occluded common femoral vein and with collaterals. This is the day of treatment. It was a iliofemoral reconalization with stenting at 12th of March. So as you can see, the femoral vein, the main inflow and deep femoral vein, both are patent. That, that is a really perfect patient for treatment of chronic occlusive disease and the common femoral vein, external iliac, and also the common iliac. Please notice this is not the common iliac vein. This is only a collateral. This occluded vein is the common iliac vein. We're affected and we had a reflux of great saphenous vein, as you can see here. Then we recognized Erwin was in the OR. It was a really uh, not easy case, difficult case, took us two, three hours with, snare, with, with body floss, that means going from internal jugular vein and from antegrade. We uh, then finally predilated uh, the common iliac with 16 millimeter balloon, the common femoral vein with 14 millimeter balloon, as you can see in the waist of the balloon. This is the, after the stenting using a 16 to 140 millimeter stent, and lengthen it with a small overlap with 14 to 100 millimeter. And now the completion angiogram. Just please compare these both with each other. Would you leave this patient without treatment of this occlusion and just treat the great saphenous vein? I don't think so. This is the great saphenous vein, still refluxive, but you see the highway is now open. This is the post-op evaluation of the patient last week. You see the duplex in the common femoral vein, the duplex ultrasound finding in the external iliac vein, 
We measure every time the diameter of stent in many points and the area of the stent. And again, showing you the great saphenous vein, which remain patent after over stenting, but still after Walzova maneuver, showing a reflux. So this picture before the procedure with the drainage, not because of any treatment, because of a severe lymphorrhea and the post-op evaluation last week without treating the great saphenous vein insufficiency. So in conclusion, dear colleagues, all patients should have a profound medical examination with a complete precisely performed duplex ultrasound. I think Mark agrees with this point. In a patient with iliofemoral or caval, chronic venous obstruction and additional superficial reflux, we do not know if we are dealing with a primary or secondary superficial reflux. Therefore, the chronic venous obstruction should be treated first because this is the reason of the more severe hypertension. We all are still working, of course, on optimizing var um, various strategies, but we are not there yet. Treatment of varicoses alone will not solve patient symptoms if there is a deep venous obstruction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Homan. It was a very nice talk and very nice presentation. Uh, great, I think, uh, now I have to introduce my dear friend, uh, Dr. Mark Whitley. Dr. Mark Whitley is a senior vascular consultant in Whitley Clinic. Uh, and as you all know, Mark was the first man who, do, who did endovascular ablation in the United Kingdom and the first who did uh, microwave ablation in Europe. And uh, he's doing the first HIVO echotherapy in the United Kingdom and he has a lot of uh, 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 papers. He published more than 120 and four chapter books. Uh, he's the editorial, he's one, of, uh, he's one of the editorial board of Journal of Vascular Surgery uh, of Venus and, lymph uh, and Lymphology. Uh, now uh, he is going to defend his opinion and he will go against the motion. Uh, the mic is yours now, Mark. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. And that was a fascinating talk, uh, Hooman. Thank you. I think you've agreed with me, actually. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. And we'll go through why. I hope everybody watching this is keeping safe from COVID at the moment. And uh, I hope this is a nice distraction for those who are in the front line. Luckily, uh, being a vein surgeon, I'm not so much at the moment. So. This is what we were asked to debate upon, and that's in a patient with iliac vein compression stenosis or occlusion and varicose veins, I go for iliac decompression first. And most of us will agree that we wouldn't when we actually look at the question. What is a debate? So the definition of debate is a formal discussion which we're having on a certain matter, and that's the question we've been given in a public meeting, which we're doing it usually ends with a vote. So we've had all before and afterwards. So we have to have opposing arguments. And of course, what are the opposing arguments? The first one appears obvious, and you've just heard this one put forward. And if anyone would understand that if you have flow from the foot towards the heart, if you put an outflow obstruction to the leg, you should get some sort of venous hypertension, if you just heard, which may give you varicose veins as part of other things. So it would be obvious, and we'd all agree instantly in this situation, in a very simplistic view, that we'd relieve the outflow first. And that's what we've just heard. And Homan's done a fantastic job here from his ResearchGate photo. As you know, he's published very, very widely in C3, C4, C5, C6 disease. And he's just presented two cases, not of varicose veins, but he's presented two cases of C4, 5 and 6 disease. He's also shown uh, in the past, Maythern is actually quite a rare clinical condition, which I'd agree with. And also he's a very, an expert in post-thrombotic syndrome. Again, not a patient with varicose veins. So this debate is actually looking at when you have these iliac lesions, but the patient's got varicose veins, he goes for iliac decompression first. That's what we're actually looking at. And we're actually looking at C2 disease in these patients. That's what the disease is. We all agree about C3 and more disease. What this is asking about, or the question we've been given is, what do we do in C2 disease, a patient presenting with varicose veins? 
So what are the major questions that we have to ask to actually answer this question? Firstly, what did the patient present with? And secondly, how did we diagnose the compression, the stenosis or the occlusion? And when we come to occlusions, I have to agree, you know, an occlusion is occlusion, but we're really talking about the majority of patients who may have a compression or stenosis. So firstly, we're doctors. We treat patients and we should treat patients, not images or tests. This debate is about patients with varicose veins, C2. So let's forget all the heroic C3, C4, C5 and C6. We are not talking about those at all. We are only talking about when patients turn up to you with varicose veins, which should we treat first? Should we or should we not treat the outflow? And I agree for C3 and more, if there's an iliac lesion, of course we should look at that. But for C2, is that correct? As with everything in veins, one of the things that's really struck me as I've gone through phlebology for the last 20 years is how we forget things we've learned in other branches of medicine because phlebology is still relatively early. So what do we know from arterial surgery? We know, first of all, that if we want to know whether it's a significant stenosis, the gold standard is pressure. There's a pressure drop across a stenosis. P1, P2, if there's a drop, it's significant. Secondly, we can then look at a Doppler or duplex velocity change, but we have to remember that that is not a gold standard. That is only estimating a pressure drop. And thirdly, if we image something, if we look at a stenosis from an imaging point of view, there's a multitude of papers in the 1980s and 1990s showing that images can look the same but have completely different hemodynamic effects because of cross-sectional area. So even in arteries, we know that imaging is an estimate of flow, which is an estimate of pressure, and therefore is a very inaccurate way to look. Even with the great IVUS, we still are making an estimate of a hemodynamic measurement. So when we look at ilia veins, things are even harder. We've got those same three problems, including IVUS, which is an image, not functional. And on top of that, we've also got a low pressure flow system. So if you're trying to measure pressure across a stenosis in the venous system, you're really counting on a few millimeters of mercury. And there's no constant pump that gives you that nice regular pressure change to measure. And these pressures change massively, position, even movement, respiratory changes. Veins have a very, very wide variation in diameter, even in normal situations until they're turgid, unlike arteries. And also we have the sump effects. These sump effects, we published and won a prize for the pseudo nutcracker, and a pseudo methern has already uh, been shown as well. And with these, we're, we're, what we think on a lot of imaging is a stenosis and causing a bypass has been shown in these pseudo systems that when you actually include the root out, suddenly what looked like a stenosis suddenly disappears. And so there's an awful lot of imaging in MRI, CT, venography, even IVUS that is actually false because it's looking at a cross-sectional area or a diameter, and it's not actually looking at the stenosis. So when we talk about compression and stenosis, we have to be absolutely certain that we're talking about that. Why, how do you know this is true? Well, we can see this in practice because when we're looking at pelvic vein reflux, some people have said that in pelvic vein reflux causing pelvic congestion syndrome, up to 80% of cases have got a compression and need stenting. Whereas in our 20 year experience, we only find it in one to two cases. And surely if we were missing 78% of cases, we would now have lawsuits through the country. I mean, we would be having terrible results and we haven't. So does it matter? I mean, you might turn around and say, well, if we're paid to you know, find stenosis and if we're paid to put stents in, does it matter if we put them into these C2 patients first, if they've only got varicose veins? And of course the answer is yes, not just morally, should we be careful of it? But there are complications of ileal vein stents. Now, where, again, in occlusions, I think that goes without saying for C3, C4, C5, those are high risk patients in post thrombotic syndrome, those are all patients, but they don't present with just C2 disease. And with lots and lots of papers showing that these stents can move in patients with minor iliac stenosis, if they're present at all, they can go to the heart, they can go to the spinal area, they can go up to the right, uh, through the right ventricle and into the lungs. We also know that the etiological thrombosis, you get early thrombosis and you also get late intimal hyperplasia occlusions. We also look, if you look at the um, paper from Reju, looking at what happens when you put these into patients 
over the years, at 10 years, there's a 13% reintegration rate, and that's for the non-thrombotic ones. So the difficulty with this is when you ablate a vein, because you're reducing it with laser, microwave, whatever you're using to ablate, you get a permanent destruction. You've closed the vein, it's curative. Your patient and you can rest easy because the patient's gone home and is happy. If you stent the patient, which is the usual way of decompressing them, you've got to keep that vein open. You might have to anticoagulate them. You certainly have to monitor them over time. And both your patient and you will worry for the rest of that patient's life because it can always go down. So the principles is I believe you should only stent or operate for decompression when it's clinically needed, that's C3 disease and more, when the cost, the risk of stenting, monitoring and treatment of any complications clearly is in the best interest of patients. And in patients who have varicose veins, C2, which is what this debate's about, it's unlikely that you will find that benefit is available for most patients. Finally, if you do vote for this motion as it has been presented, not all the other paraphernalia, but as it's been presented, it will be the end of most vascular venous clinics at present. Because if you think that you must always treat any iliac compression that you see, no matter how mild, then uh, because a patient has varicose veins, it means every patient who turns up with varicose veins, you should be checking their iliacs. And if you think you find a stenosis using these criteria, you will need to stent them. And then you suddenly go into all of that follow-up and monitoring. And of course, 20 years of endovenous experience in our clinic has shown that's not correct. The vast majority of patients that you treat go, and we've just published our 15-year audit, even for the early days, showing that most of our patients get excellent long-term results with thermal ablation. So therefore, I do ask you, although I love Kuhlman and he's very, very good at, at, at talking, I would like ask you to vote against him and vote against this motion, the way it has been presented, which is for a patient with varicose veins, and also join our registry so we can find out who is actually right in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> uh, I, I think this is very good point of view and a very good presentation. Uh, and I think it is uh, the moment now to make the, uh, the polling again. Are you ready, Mr. Khaled? Uh, Mr. Khaled, please uh, do the polling. Yes. Uh, this is the polling again. In a patient with iliac vein compression, stenosis or occlusion, and varicose veins, I go for iliac decompression first with the motion. Dr. Homan Jale, again the motion, Dr. Mark Whitley. Please vote uh, again and see what was going after this presentation. And after we get the results, we have to make some discussion. I think we have a lot of discussion from the panel and from the attendees. Thank you both. You did a very good job and you clarified uh, your point of view clearly and give very good impression for attendees and for all of us. Thank you. Uh, we are waiting for the results. Just a few seconds. I think it will take about uh, 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, we'll open the discussion for the panel uh, after we get the, the results. And we'll show both results before and after the presentations during our talking with our speakers and panelists and attendees. Please, uh, Mr. Khaled, when uh, you are ready, put the results uh, on the screen. Okay, let us uh, save the time and uh, start our discussion. It's, uh, yes, uh, it, it's, it's very a, good. Uh, Mr. Khalid have shared the screen, and Mark Whitley have uh, converted from ninety three before the debate. He made it.
to be, I think, 61 or 62. It's, it's fascinating. You can see the effect of the argument on this slide. Can you see uh, Professor Ayman before and after? Uh, Mark, uh, could you take your... Uh, Okay. Khalid is sharing the results of pre and post. Professor Ayman, can you see it? Yes, I did. Did you see the results, uh, all of you, the panel yes. and uh, the, atten the attendees? Did you see the results, Mark? <coughs> Good work, Mark Whitley. If it was just a little bit, you would have been winning and reverted the argument, but uh, this is all success. I think we can take a short comment from Homan and Mark Whitley. It was very enjoyable uh, competition, I would say. Yes, let me start by Homan. What's Thank your you. comment? Homan? Congratulations to Mark, a great speaker. So that was my disadvantage that my opponent is a perfect guy. So. Um, Thank you, Mark, for nice presentation. Um, of course, I think the question or the title should be a little bit changed and, and maybe, maybe somehow symptomatic or, or severe symptomatic, something like this should be included because of course, if a patient is coming to us with a C2 pathology and let us say this patient has a reflux, has a superficial reflux in great saphenous vein. and occlusion, we are not going to do anything in this patient if then only, probably only, compression is stuck in grade two. So we are not going to treat the occlusion, we are not going to treat the superficial reflux because I am not sure if this patient has a secondary varicosis or a primary varicosis, could be both. So, and we have no evidence in this, uh, in, in this special case, therefore we do not do anything. But in a patient with C4, C5 or C6 uh, pathology or level of the pathology, I think as I showed you the hypertension created by a occlusion which mark also supported should be treated first at com the, the compression or occlusion and then thinking after six months after one year if there are rem uh, complaints remaining then of course treating the superficial reflux but very important is how we uh, com occlusion is occlusion but how we diagnose a compression especially my turn up as Mark told, Mark exaggerated, of course, in, uh, <laughs> because he wanted the presentation to be nice, but it is the truth. There are people, there are centers, there are colleagues who put a stent in everyone who comes with a compression. And if you put an IVUS, as Mark told, venous system is very, very polymorph. And there are many, many compression sites and you can put everywhere a um, stent just because you put an IVUS in it. And this is not, not how we recommend it. Again, a severe symptomatic patient should be first decompressed or stented, and then the superficial reflux should be approached. Thank you. Great. And uh, now it's your uh, turn, Mark. Congratulations uh, for your good and perfect uh, presentation. Please, Thank you. Uh, you have to comment. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think one of these advantages of these debates is it makes the person who's been given the question and often asked to defend a position they might not actually truly totally believe in. It makes you have to really think about what you're, um, how to win. And uh, I, have to, I have to pay tribute to the person that I think is best in this in the world, and that's Dr. Log Havnik, who for many, many years, I've watched him and on, on occasion, I've actually even had to debate against him, which is a nightmare, because what I've noticed with Lowell is he always changes the question to answer exactly <laughs> what he wants. And, and I hope you noticed I did that, Lowell. I hope you're proud of me. And I, I've got to agree, honestly, I've got to agree with what who was just said. I mean, I, we all know that when we run a simple office-based vacant centre, 
most of our patients don't have this problem. Um, and when patients do come in and they've got venous claudication, they've got swelling's not quite right, most of us have very good ultrasounds nowadays and you do pick up you know we, we can separate these two populations out quite clearly usually especially if it's post thrombotic syndrome or anything else there is that small group in the middle that we're, we're not sure about the nibbles and the various things on one side and that's what the research is for and i think one of the things that's come out of this for me is under, we've all keep saying the same thing we keep on saying the duplex is the gold standard and I'm just a little uh, there's got to be a different functional test I Ivis is lovely if you've got it and you've got the resources for it but it just gives you a, a morphology um, and the, the really it is there's something I love Chris Latimer's work with the um, with the air plasmography when it's done by gravity um, but I, I think that this is why this debate has been lovely and I've really enjoyed this with you, Human, because I'd say all your work is lovely and I've been reading your papers for this and I mean, you're, you're a very talented man and you, but it, it, the, the whole thing for this debate is trying to say what your sort of practice is, it's really very invasive for patients with big problems and the 90, 95% of people who are doing office based and it's at what stage do you need to get together and say, you know, this patient is not suitable for the office space. When do I send them to somebody, you know, who's much more interventional about this? And that's it would be lovely to have a, a, a test that gave you that answer simply. Thank you, Thank Mark. You, Mark. Uh, let me ask Bola. What do you think, Bola? Bola, do you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, yes, I agree with excellent presentation. The lecture was great. Uh, congratulations to both. And I agree with both <laughs> because, uh, you know, for uh, the C2 patients, of course, we go first to, to treat the, the varicose vein, so the, the saphenous vein. And also because 20% of the population may have a May Turner syndrome. And all these varicose veins, so the, the superficial uh, insufficiency, it could be secondary to the main or not. So um, in those patients, we go first for uh, to treat the, the, the superficial um, disease. And but if of course if there is uh, obstruction of C4, C3, uh, C4, or C5, C6, we prefer to treat and re we recommend to treat the the deep first. So. I think that uh, it's excellent all what you say, and in both both are at the same time agreeing in everything. You have a point, Paul. Martin, are you there? I think you have uh, to add I'm something. I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Sure, we do. I love I love this timing, and uh, uh, as more I'm getting into this debate, as less my wife is happy about this. You know the Venus nights, <laughs> and I'm an, and Omar, you are doing just amazing job because it's like I feel so sorry leaving Eduardo behind because there is so many questions about COVID, but this debate is so exciting uh, on its own. You know that it's so <laughs> difficult to just remember about the COVID now. So to me, you know, I I love what Homan is doing and I'm doing actually the same in Bahrain and we are very close to each other but I'm doing it with uh, Mark's book on my on my table and 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 Mark's understanding of of chronic venous insufficiency or venous hypertension is exactly as I understand it so this debate is is to me is uh, is uh, is a one question only Mark which patients coming to your clinic with varicose veins are candidates for ascending venography or any other imaging techniques to find out if they are having any obstruction in the pelvis? And that's all. That's, that's basically what this, what this whole debate is about. Absolutely right. And that's what I was just saying. That's why it's so difficult because working in a vein clinic, I'm, I'm phenomenally fortunate. I've got a Judy Holdstock as my main vascular technologist. And she's taught the other, we've got now about nine vascular technologists, and they really are quite fantastic and will often point out if they can't say there's definite iliac disease, they will usually say there's a, a high suspicion of it. So when you've got the patients, I mean, 
if a patient comes in and they are clearly got clean, they've got no history of deep vein thrombosis, there's no family history, they've never broken their leg, they've come in with an ulcer and they've got a great big, great subvenous veins, small subvenous veins and perforators, you, you, the, the, you don't really need to investigate those. When you've got somebody with potentially or definite deep vein thrombosis in the past, or they're less mobile, or the scar tissue or that you can see somewhere, or any abnormality that you see on the duplex, or even you know any obvious flank veins, those were the definites as well. The difficulty is, you know, as we say, is that middle ground where somebody's a bit unwell, you know, it's not quite right, and that's one where you have to go. And as I say, there's no perfect test for that. But I think when you've got a hundred patients in front of you uh, on a day in the clinic only one or two aren't obvious. That's my feeling at the moment. And that's why I get concerned when I write, read these papers about the huge number of patients who get stented um, in some uh, practices. I, I, think, I think we might live, live to regret some of the stents that have been put into uh, cleaner veins. I don't know what you think about that, Herman. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. I uh, think the same, Mark, maybe just one remark. I think very important is patients who are coming to me in Aachen, they are not from Aachen. They are coming from all parts in Germany or maybe neighboring countries. So many of them are coming already with somehow history, some past medical history, which is going into the point of chronic venous obstruction with DVT, maybe multiple DVTs or there are suspicions of, of, of DVT. So uh, my patient's uh, population is, I think, totally different as you have the patient in, in UK, in London. So therefore you have 2% or 3% of them have uh, obstruction or stenosis. And I think in my uh, daily work, Irvin is uh, nearly every day there. Um, maybe, 40, 50% or 60% of patients have pelvic congestion or compression or stenosis. But exactly I agree, we do, don't have to over-treat these patients. We don't have Treat to over-treat I think, the, uh, yeah. I think Dr. Kavnik, uh, you have to make a comment too, please. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. You both won. You both selected your patient population, which was great. <laughs> um, I am about to give you my only opinion, and opinions are just what they are. I think C2 disease for sure. Um, I would never stent that. I think it's criminal, and that's a moot point. Uh, and that could even be C3 if, if, if you haven't really done your full investigation. As we get to five and six, I think then, you know, there, there's certainly 4B, 5, and 6. There comes to be an issue, and I'm going back into history. Uh, before we uh, looked at May Thurner, and I'm not talking about thrombotic lesions. I'm talking about simply an obstructive lesion like a May Thurner or a compression. If we have a patient that has a May Thurner and has C4, B, 5, and 6, in the past, we didn't know about that. It was an exam question on our boards. May Thurner, what is it? Now it's, it's, it's right there. So we used to go ahead and ablate those or strip those veins. And a lot of times we got the patient's ulcers to heal. And they stayed healed. But we don't have any randomized controlled trial to look at those patients to see if we're doing which one to do first, ablative, which obviously is an easier technique and has lower morbidity than putting in a stent in a 20 year old or 25 year old who's got C4B five and six. So these are just my conjectures and thank you for the floor. Thank you. Leon. Thank you, Leon. Uh, Dr. Morrison, please. Yeah. Uh, we want your opinion uh, in that uh, debate and uh, what's your comment for both uh, speakers. I think this is a perfect example of uh, the danger of making assumptions. I think when most of us read that question, we assumed we were talking about a C4 through C6 patient, and that was a, uh, not a correct assumption had we assumed that it was any of the patients 
any C classification, we probably would have voted differently. So it was a nice demonstration of the fallacy and the danger of assumption. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Cavizzi, uh, let me uh, hear your voice. Yeah. So I am so much in favor of Mark that I want to add four more arguments, let's say. First, uh, if you look at the primary patency rate of endovenous treatment, it goes from 36% to say 60 or 70% in the majority of the cases. So this is something to keep in mind, primary. Secondary, that's another story, but that means money again. <laughs> So then second argument would be that we always forget about pump. I mean, whatever we do on the aliac vein would depend for varices or what, for whatsoever on the condition of the pump, diaphragmatic pump and the calf pump. So whatever we do up also depends on what, what is down. So we don't, we don't need to take care only of uh, the aliac vein on a varicose vein patient. Then Mark clearly told that we transform an office intervention of 100 euro, let's say, in a hospital intervention, which is maybe 3,000 euro. And so to do that, you need much more evidence. The very last argument would be that uh, Ugo Parch was fantastic in questioning Raju and Neglin in Barcelona at the EV, a European Venus Forum. And he was asking, do we have the evidence that uh, an occluded or stenosed aliac vein in a varicose patient, of course, is better than a fully patent and fully refluxing aliac vein? So that's another issue to keep in mind, let's say. That's all. Great. You give us uh, more than one point to discuss. Oh, all are quite uh, difficult, I just think. I think uh, Professor Homan want to go can back. I add something? To yes. Sure, Homan, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavezzi. I just would, would like to comment on, on this comment from Dr. Cavezzi. You mentioned 36% to 60 highest or 70%. No, this is not correct. In our patients' population and other centers, if we mix all patients together, if we mix all patients together, we achieve a patency rate of now over seven, eight, nine years or 10 years of 80%, 90%, 82%. But it is very important to know what we are including in these in this results or in these in this papers, in these studies. Therefore, we need a classification of these patients with chronic venous obstruction as we discussed it in the last uh, presentation a few weeks ago. So if we consider only as Mark and Lowell now talked about C2 patients with compression and stenting, I am not advocating any stenting in C2 patients, never ever, but <laughs> if we stent a real myterna hemodynamic myterna patient, hemodynamic significant uh, stenosis, we have 100% patency rate, not only our center, many other centers. So we have really to distinguish between myterna and chronic venous obstruction with involvement of the inflow veins, which is in our classification for A or for B or even five. They have, if, if we look on these patients, indeed they have 50% patency or 55% patency. But 36 is old, is not, not actual. Well, it was from a systematic review from Alun Davis. I took the, the figure only from that. Maybe, it's not maybe in, 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 yeah, but not in experienced centers. Well, I yeah. agree. What, one of the things, uh, if I can make two points as well, just to say that one of the things that worried me that man at CACBS about three years ago, Peter Glowinski presented just one case and it was such an interesting case. It was a girl, I think she was 26, and she had had a stent put in to a query method, and sort of one of those ones, that, or a nibble, it wasn't much, but she had healthy veins. And 10 years later, they opened her up because she was getting into a hyperplasia. And he thought, he was trying to remove the wall stent, and was the, thought he was going to get this new way of getting wall sense out just by hooking it you know, out bit by bit and he said it's coming out really easily but then of course what happened is once the wall stent came out or the neo-interval hyperplasia just occluded the vein and she ended up with a really big bypass 
And the, I think you really have to earn your stent because the, the, uh, when we put a stent into an occluded vein or you put a stent into a PTS, that, that's fantastic because you've got a ruined vein already. Where we have to be so careful is a healthy vein that we think might be compressed or might be stones. And you really have to earn your stent. And that, that's, I think, the big problem. Second thing, from my point of view, just to go through, because uh, I'm fascinated by what Humans just said about the referral patterns, because of course it's all about referral patterns, isn't it? We, uh, we published our 12 year results on doing just endovenous surgery for leg ulcers. And we had 85% long-term healing and no one was referred for stenting in that time. And in the, in the whole of my practice in, um, in, the, uh, in, in doing leg ulcers, I probably referred about 1% of people, maybe half a percent for, um, for stenting, and probably investigated about 2%. And I, 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 this, this is more of a sort of talk rather than, I don't have a conclusion to this, but the, when you see the patients in front of you, they do form into two quite distinct groups with only a small amount of um, the crossover between the good ones. And I think I think it's a really important way we've got to reclassify these rather than just see by six. Yes, so this is a good point to reclassification. Yes, you are right. Uh, let's fly to Brazil and uh, ask Dr. Scuderi. What do you think, Dr. Scuderi? What's your uh, personal experience in that subject? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate both the, the very, very nice presentations are very interesting. But I think the problem is basically in the in the question, for example, the question is, in the patient with the liquid compression, stenosis, or occlusion, and varicose veins, I go to a liquid compression first. But if we make an inversion of, in this question, like that, in patients with, with varicose veins, with iliac compression Maybe is never. different oh, that's cool. because you have first the varicose veins. The patient come to us for varicose veins, not for the complication of varicose veins. And so I, I, I agree with Mark because we are talking about the patient with C2. When the patient is C2, we don't go to the iliac, iliac vein directly. We make an investigation of the, the most common causes. And only after that, if we have edema, if we have a, a, a man, or other complications in the uh, duplex ultrasound, we go to the investigation. And so the, the answer of this question, in my opinion, is the Mark, Mark question. Is, Mark is right. This is my, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to take part of this great, uh, great group. Uh, great, of great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, this was great. Uh, Askat, please, uh, I want to, to know what's your experience in Kazakhstan? Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you very much to all speakers. Uh, both of speakers uh, demonstrated uh, what should we do. Uh, we should avoid um, over-treating. We should we do uh, arrange uh, correct diagnostic process. We should uh, we should have uh, good equipped. Um, practice. So, uh, both I, I agree with both lectures. Of course, Mark, uh, after clarifying the questions with C2, uh, increased his uh, uh, rate of voice. And um, uh, in Kazakhstan, we have uh, different approaches. It uh, depends on uh, if we uh, work in, uh, for example, in big uh, uh, 
big, big uh, endovascular centers with good equipped uh, departments. Of course, uh, we we observe that all doctors from these uh, medical centers could arrange immediately diagnose <coughs> all severe uh, cases of uh, post-thrombotic syndrome or uh, maternal syndrome. But in uh, small phlebology practice or medical centers which uh, has um, uh, only varicose vein treatment, of course, uh, uh, many doctors uh, work uh, in collaboration with endovascular surgeons with uh, other medical clinics. So, um, thank you very much again, uh, both lectures, great lectures, and thank you very much for being part of this great webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I think Dr. Hello. Victor Canetta uh, has to put uh, some remarks too. Okay, was a great presentation of uh, both of them. I think they could uh, deliver the, the place that we're supposed to be. But sometimes um, I've been thinking already trying to change my the way that I've been working, but the way that approach with uh, a clear definition about what, who, and when you have to be to extend the patient is the final idea that we're supposed to take. And also the other recommendations are very, very nice. I think the future is we have to go for it the iliac extending is in our blood or everybody is trying to improve practice, trying to improve, and we will have everything in the future in my office. I just get in touch with the engineers and everybody else to TR and also to have everything. Everybody will be just the, the advantage we have about new techniques, and we are learning. And in the future, we will do it without big trouble. I think both of you give a great presentation. Thanks for letting me in as always. And the webinar is increasing the people that already know about phlebology all over the world. Thanks, Ayman, thank Omar, and thanks to everybody else. Thank you, Victor. Now it's time for Erwin. I know you are a great uh, sonographer and you see a lot a lot of these patients and uh, you have a good opinion oh, let's hear it well I, I would like to congratulate congratulate both speakers um the motion was a trick i think uh, the word that was missing was symptomatic i don't think anybody whether you're going to to see people with an eye compression that has been demonstrated by kibis publication in maastricht they showed 75 percent of healthy volunteers having eye compression. I don't think Homer would have said, come on, send them all here and we will stand them. And it's the same with the C2 story. I think, Mark, if you have somebody coming in with varicosities, I think you would feel very guilty if you were taking away collaterals coming away from the groin, crossing the pudenda region. And I know a lot of young women who are really disturbed by these varicosities. And I would like to point out, we have patients with venous claudication with a C0, and, and this is really surprising. No clinical manifestations, but they have complaints. And you do the, your, your, your diagnostics and you find that they have deep venous disease and, and it's been hidden. And I, and I think if you are honest and if you look at your population, you were talking about ulceration. We did the Dutch SEP study and it was shown that the, the, the patient group who had recurrent and received you know, these, these, uh, these ulcerations that weren't healing, 50% of those patients had deep venous disease that wasn't discovered. And that's what we realized that the whole SEP studies, which was focused on perforating veins, it was quite wrong to focus on the perforating veins. We should have been identifying deep venous disease. And these perforating veins were actually collateral pathways, which we were trying to remove. And instead of making people better, we were making people worse. And we have to realize this. We have to identify really asking the patients, 
what are the complaints? I think if we had the motion saying patient with complaints and really defining which complaints, and I think we have to target people with venous claudication rather than saying, oh, you have a C4, and that's when I'm really going to be interested in probably looking at the deep venous system. I think that's why I'm advocating to anybody who has any kind of suspicion of venous disease to do a complete scan, whether they have a C1, C0. I mean, this discussion is ongoing. And a lot of people who just do SCT out of office every time, I think that the modern day equipment, even the mobile equipment, if you uh, ask the, the supplier for a, a curve the rate transducer, you're, it's very easy to see the deep venous system. And we should really routinely uh, investigate and, and, and exclude deep venous disease before advancing. And then saying, listening to the patient and really promising them a certain outcome. It's never certain, but we have to give them a clear cut a uh, pathway and a plan saying we've seen this, we've excluded this possibility, it's now only varicosities that we're going to be focusing on and we should not be asking ourselves did I remove a collateral pathway, did I leave something, because I've seen anterior branches, accessory branches where we see the reflux and then suddenly it's a side branch collateral going up to the abdominal region. I think Atilio, you've seen this often enough and I think you would feel guilty as well if you didn't look at the iliac region and say oh, maybe there was an obstruction there and this is a collateral branch I'm going to be treating. So I'd say I'd advise anybody doing any kind of venous uh, whether it's out of office uh, in a private clinic or in an academic hospital like home in the city to really say, okay, duplex ultrasound should be mandatory to do a complete scan and then oh, that complete scan, proceed from there and then give them an honest answer to the expectations that you can offer your patient. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Erwin. Now uh, I'll leave the mic for Omar. Uh, take over, Omar, please. Okay, thank you very much. I think there is uh, a comment from Martin Marish. I hope his mic is open. I hope so. I hope you can hear me. This is the very last comment. I, I, I love the, the discussion and it's extremely important because I'm also hesitant to put the stand for a young young ladies usually you know suffering from from chronic chronic insufficiency, but on the other hand, you know the for a time being, according to what we have heard in this discussion, what we are saying is this: we all agree that there are two reasons for venous hypertension on the lower limbs, and it might be the obstruction or the reflux. And we all agree about this. But what we are saying differently is that if it is C2, forget about obstruction. It doesn't matter. Don't even look for it. But if it is like C3, 4, 5, let's treat it now. Let's treat it. It's important. So how come? So again, I'm asking like guys, if the patient is coming with varicose veins, which is very likely to go further, you know, uh, in clinical uh, in clinical symptoms, who out of these patients is a candidate for further imaging and look for the obstruction which can cause this venous hypertension as well? And who is candidate for treatment? You know, let us find the the firm criteria for these patients. Okay, thank you very much. That, that was great. Um, comment and uh, we have a question from Professor Dr. Ahmed Gawish. If we can open his mic, he has, he raised his hand about 15 minutes ago. Uh, <coughs> Professor Ahmed Gawish, one of the eminent uh, uh, Venus interventionists in Egypt. Uh, you can speak now, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Dr. Omar. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you very well. Great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for this very uh, interesting and hot debate. Uh, the two speakers are extremely brilliant uh, in their uh, presentation. Actually, uh, this well, I have a comment. Uh, uh, I think uh, the debate. Yeah, we we needed to focus more on the C two symptomatic disease, uh, which Mark highlighted, and I think um, that Mark uh, last slide was very important. Is that uh, we should we go to 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 close the vein clinics and uh, investigate every patient for iliac vein uh, disease? I, I think this is not this should not be the case as well. So in uh, I don't think we we can we can say that 
uh, every iliac vein, more than 50% stenosis should be stented. And on the other hand, we cannot say also that all patients with C2 disease, having varicose veins, uh, has to be ablated and we, can, and we omit uh, a, a very a significant iliac obstruction. And significant by significant, I mean not 50% stenosis. So what Dr. Irwin highlighted is very important is that we have to be symptom focused and rather than we, we are focused on 50% stenosis because some symptoms are mainly obstructive. You cannot find the, a patient with reflux having venous medication uh, because any reflux, however it's severe, has to improve with walking. If it didn't, if it didn't improve, then there is an, a significant obstruction up there. And that we cannot omit, I think, uh, um, in patients with C, even with C2 disease. So I, I, I have uh, some criteria that I presented before in Mark's conference back in 2017 in the College of Lobology Conference uh, and in many conferences that we used to investigate many patients having venous disease, chronic venous disease with CT venography. We, we didn't stent all the patients that we found uh, having iliac vein compression. However, we were able to, to find um, those patients that we can select uh, those who would benefit from iliac vein stenting. And some of the criteria we, we, we had, uh, I would like to share with you. Um, the clinical criteria was the presence of venous claudication was an indication for stenting even in patients with C2 disease. In patients who have a history of DVT, we have to investigate the deep vein system, of course, uh, in, in post-thrombotic cases. And in patients having bizarre distribution of varicose veins, some, some of the pictures uh, Human Jalade or showed us um, anterior abdominal wall veins, uh, the unusual distribution of varicose veins always highlights the presence of significant obstruction. Uh, in patients having varicose veins as well with huge uh, increasing girth, um, I don't think increased girth of, of, the, of the limb is a sign of reflux. It doesn't happen. It, it, it's not like the usual edema. So not when, sure we, when we start... Rahma, that was a nice comment. Uh, yeah, I'm, you I'm just want to add a comment. Do you like to add something else quickly? No, no, I, I just, I, I wrap up. The, 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 the idea is that we have to develop strict criteria on which patients we should go for investigating the deep veins. And in this case, we would only stent those who are indicated for stenting. That's that's the, the comment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, um, thank you. Do you like a quick reply, uh, Professor Homan or Professor Mark? A quick reply? No, thank you. I thank uh, for the in invitation. And um, it was a really nice debate. Perfect presentation from Mark. And again, I am not talking about C2 disease. Of course, nobody with C2 is treated or without any symptoms is treated. But uh, from my colleague, Dr. Gavish, it was very important to highlight again the venous claudication, which is pathognomonic for chronic venous obstruction. You don't believe how impaired th these patients are who are coming to our center with this venous claudication and in these patients, you have to think about the recanalization. Okay, Professor Whitey. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and, I mean, I think this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, Irwin's just pointed out, you know, the, the, the figures are very, very interesting because those of us who work in vein clinics, you know, it is almost all reflux disease. Um, and uh, it, it is that difficult. And as Ahmed's just said, I thought that was a fantastic uh, observation. And I think those criteria are really useful because uh, quite correctly, you should not be getting venous claudication when you're walking, things should get better. And that and abnormal veins and a history of DVT, I think you know, that's the basis of a really good clinical set of guidelines. I mean, we, we've published papers in the past, as I said, you know, we've cured um, a huge number of leg ulcers. And I think the Evra study and also the um, uh, Eshkar study, I mean, they, they basically used endovenous or superficial vein surgery and perforated vein surgery, one or two people, but mainly endovenous surgery and foam and showed these great results. You know, the, what, there wasn't a lot of deep vein problem there. And I think we are talking about different populations and 
the difficulty when we talk across countries and in different units is, you know, we all have different experiences because we have different populations. I work in a private clinic and a couple of my early works in pelvic veins, I suddenly thought, gosh, am I only seeing people who read the papers and who come to see me because they can afford it? So we had to compare some of our results with the, you know, the National Health Service. And we published a paper showing that we were trying to do that. And, you know, similarly, how many people, especially with leg ulcers, never get to a doctor? Because the in England, certainly, most of them only ever see nurses and they don't get released. They don't get the opportunity to see a doctor to get diagnosed. So when we talk about percentages, it's quite easy to get very argumentative. But I don't, I don't think we're seeing 100 percent of the population to talk about is the trouble. But. But I think I think so, I've made lots of notes today uh, to some very interesting points that need to be discussed. And I think, you know, on one side, if a patient comes to me in my clinic and they've got C3, C4, C5, C6, I'm still not going to think about deep veins in the majority of them. But if you have this this debate where you say we already had think that there's an iliac stenosis and a problem, then, of course, you instantly are focusing on the iliac system. And it would be nice to have a screening test to sort of say, you know, those patients who don't have a clear deep vein thrombus, don't have a clear stenosis we see with the ultrasound, you know, is there something we have to investigate really carefully? The I think what you said, Owen, I mean, it would be lovely if everybody got a full ultrasound in our clinic. We totally agree with you. That's what we do for everybody. I think for international standards and time periods, especially for public health services, we're going to, you know, that's not going to be in the short term. I think what we need is a screening test for those who need to be sent for the expert care that you you, you provide. But um, I, as I say, thank you, Huber. It's been a fantastic conversation. I really, I didn't mind me, you know, twiddling. I did, the, I did the, what I call the Kabnik effect, you know, change hands. And thank you, for, <laughs> thank you very much, Ava and Omar, for inviting me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Okay, and I will take one final question from uh, one of the eminent vascular surgeons in Egypt, Professor Ahmad Din Hussein. If we can uh, bring Professor Ahmad and open his mic. He is a professor of vascular surgery from Ain Shams University. He also practices in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and Italy. And he's very interested in venous disease. Uh, professor Ahmed, can you open your mic, unmute yourself, and ask your question? Um, until he opens his mic, I would like to invite everyone for a very important webinar tomorrow uh, at 1 o'clock Cairo time regarding COVID-19 and virus-related thrombosis. We'll have Professor Wang, one of the most eminent professor in management vascular disease COVID-19, plus a lecture from Russia and from Europe, and you are all invited and all our guests. You can speak now, Professor Ahmed. Can you speak, Professor Ahmed? Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Uh, excellent debate. I think both debaters were um, fantastic. Uh, they were able to rest their case, uh, but uh, as any um, high caliber debate, it leaves us probably with uh, more questions than answers. I go quickly now to the, uh, uh, the crucial uh, debate question. Um, Dr. Whiteley uh, and then Dr. Jai, um, how do you think the, the near future would be? Are we changing concepts over here as far as uh, going into invasive uh, venous diagnostic workup uh, in, I would say, probably like uh, uh, C2, C3 uh, patients? Uh, and how? much percent, uh, Dr. Whiteley first, uh, of your patients would be in the borderline gray zone, uh, iliac pseudo uh, compression versus uh, not? Thank you very much. I think, I think it's very interesting. I think probably those of us with an academic interest are probably going to be doing more investigations and, you know, are pushing it so that we actually make it easier for the people who don't want to do the academic side. I think that's probably going to be the, the answer. I mean, everything's trying to move into the office. Everything's trying to move to be less invasive um, and uh, more office-based local anesthetic ambulatory. 
And we, we, but on top of that, we are understanding the venous system isn't just from toes to groins, which is what we used to think is linked to vein surgeons, it's toes to heart. And that's all the intra-abdominal veins as well. I think we're a very exciting time. Um, and I don't think there's a clear answer for you. I think a lot of disease is relatively simple, but with medical legal problems now, and also the fact that we've got such fantastic um, machines such as duplex and the people who can use them properly, I think that you know we need to be investigating more people. So the, the, we need to start having algorithms so that maybe in the future not everybody has to go through every investigation, and so, but we can be safe and secure and know from studies that we're doing the right thing for patients. Point taken. Thank you very much, and Dr. Jari, you have something to add. Yes, that was a great question, a great discussion after a great, uh, fascinating debate. And uh, the mic is back to you, Professor Ayman. Thank you, Omar. <clears throat> after this great debate and uh, great interactive discussion, uh, I have to thank all our speakers. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Homan. Thank you, Mark. You were great, all of you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our uh, great panelists, thank you uh, Nick, thank you Bola, thank you Angelo, and thank you Atelio, thank you Erwin, thank you Martin, thank you Scott, thank you Victor, you were uh, great and uh, you have very good points to share with us all, thank you. I'd like to thank all attendees, I hope you get uh, more interesting interaction with us. Uh, before I go, I would like to remind you about uh, the next uh, webinar meeting uh, on Friday, on the next Friday, at the same time at 7 p.m. Egypt timing. We have uh, Fabrico uh, Santiago from Brazil and another great debate, uh, Dr. Chris Rack with Dr. Victor Canetta. It will be a great debate concerning the point where we stop ablation close to the sphenofemoral junction or two centimeter away. Let's see what they are going to discuss with us uh, next uh, Friday. Uh, thank you. Uh, I remind you about the uh, webinar meeting tomorrow at one o'clock. It will be great uh, webinar for COVID and thrombosis too. We have three great speakers. Thank you all. Uh, see you on Friday. Please stay safe and goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.